is uh, somebody who wants to reflect on the value that a trained facilitator or the value that a good facilitator, whether partial or impartial, was able to add to the uh, negotiation. Anyone? The facilitator has to be uh, well versed in negotiation skills because they are dealing with so many other different ideas. Uh, keeping their benefit also in uh, view, they have to listen to other folks. I mean, our facilitator was amazing. Mm -hmm. We were done in one hour. I mean, we had choices we could make. She gave us the space, but then she was like very well versed in negotiation which is very important for a facilitator. They have to be a trained facilitator. That's, that's very important. Akia, do you think that the presence of a neutral facilitator, I remember we were having this discussion outside and I think, I think that some of the comments you made were very valuable. Do you think that the presence of a neutral facilitator uh, would change the outcome? <coughs> See, a facilitator, the neutral facilitator uh, to me is almost like an oxymoron. The facilitator is supposed to be neutral, not supposed to be biased. So yes, they are all, they all have their personal baggage and they have their experiential learning. But when you reach the position and when you've been put in that position, it is the expectation that you will be able to move beyond your personal experiences and listen to both the sides and then come to, you know, you uh, sort of direct and channel that discussion in a manner where some fair outcome can uh, be reached. So I don't think that, uh, you know, because my background is cricket, so basically when the term neutral umpire used to be, uh, you know, written or approached, so I said, but umpires are supposed to be neutral. So either you can say a biased umpire or, a, or a, it's a good umpire versus a bad umpire. <coughs> An umpire is supposed to be neutral. So similarly, a facilitator is supposed to be neutral on the basis of their scholarship, on the basis of their uh, experience, on the basis of their research. So they are supposed to be neutral. But then again, we, uh, I agree with what she said, but then again, we're all informed. Uh, remember the discussion we had outside? We're all informed by our experiences. Uh, as Faisal Nafi yesterday pointed out that the choice of Raymond Lafayette for the Badlihar case even though he was a neutral facilitator, but he was informed uh, by his experience of uh, you know, being Swiss and being upstream. So I think that does make a difference. But uh, think about how value can be created uh, by a trained facilitator and by a neutral facilitator. Value, how trust can be generated, how mutual gains can be, can be, um, can be uh, achieved. Now, so, some of you, I, I reckon, uh, have been through or have had experience of some negotiations, um, whether in your organizations, whether in your um, individual uh, capacity um, at work. Uh, do you, what did you feel about the role play? Was it was the, the role play very different from uh, the kind of negotiations that take place in real life? Uh, or do you think that this mutual gains approach that was advocated, that was embedded in the role play, is sort of value creation when you were discussing multiple packages? By, by its very design, the role play, you could, in the role play, you could only reach an agreement only if you agree on three, the, all three issues, right? And you could reach an agreement only if six out of the seven parties would, would agree. So, do you think that in, in your in your um, in real life situations this this happens? How is it different? How is the mutual gains approach different than uh, different from uh, what you what you normally encounter? I think in this role play you you actually lay out what all the stakeholders want. That's when you, sometimes when you go into negotiating, you don't think about that before. And I think it's a very useful exercise to do this whenever you have to go and negotiate something, is to lay out who is there, what is the other ones want, and what is I want, and then it's easier to negotiate. So, I just want to follow up on that. This is something, this is something that's called BACNA. It's the best, I'll, I'll spell out the acronym for you. 
uh, you, uh, it's the best alternative to negotiated agreement. That means it's your fallback option in case the agreement, the preferred negotiating agreement doesn't happen. So a mutual gains approach, such as the approach that you were required to take in the, within this role play, it involves knowing your own partner, so knowing your own best alternative, knowing your own fallback option. Uh, in the role play, you saw that there was the best choice scenario. If you were not land, your best choice scenario would be to auction off and store the water. But given that other states wouldn't agree on your storing the water, your second best choice scenario or your batna would be to auction off the water but not store it. Option 2C, which many of you I saw, but you, you agreed on. It was a part of your agreement. So, Estimating your own butna and then trying to work, trying to work to estimate others' butna is very important. It requires you to think at the same level. Okay, if, if this person is mine for this first best alternative, if the first best alternative doesn't come through, what would he be willing to settle for? Right. So the 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 best alternative to negotiating uh, negotiated agreement is very it, it's it's a very relevant concept and very uh, what do you call it, uh, useful when you're thinking about uh, uh, simulation, when you're thinking about negotiations. Some of the things I wanted to highlight in the negotiation. Um, first, as I've already done, the uh, importance of collaborative mutual gains approach. Uh, second, uh, this very important issue of prioritizing. Uh, so each of the parties, as you noticed, had one issue that was very dear to them. For Northland, it was the water allocations. For uh, Southland, it was the issue of not uh, going into backwards auditing. Uh, for uh, the Basin Authority, it was the issue of retaining control over prediction, uh, over over auditing. Right. So each of the each of the um, uh, parties had one issue that was very dear to them, and they were willing to compromise on the other issues. Right. That is, that's very important. Prioritizing issues is very important. Another thing that I did not see in any of the any of the groups, but that also I think it resembles real life situations a lot. Things that don't get decided on the table get decided off the table. Right. So the importance of side caucuses is very very. Well. We did that. Okay. I am sorry. <laughs> What it what it what it involves is that the Ministry of Environment taking you know one of the states to the side. Darwin, we're going to compensate you. Don't worry, you know if if you if you agree to giving water for environmental flows, you be assured that we have uh, you know the funding available for you, and that makes Darwin immediately agree to a solution, right? So the importance of side caucuses, not just in the <coughs> but in real life simulations as well. A lot of the things parties are afraid to speak out at the table, and many a times it gets it gets resolved outside of it. I already mentioned the importance of uh, financial incentives. Um, one thing I want you to think about, and I think that's uh, that's a theme that ran throughout yesterday and today. Water is by its very nature political. So think of some of the political dynamics involved in water management. Um, the framework that I wanted to introduce, but I don't think we have time. I've put up readings, etc. I'll quickly, very quickly, walk you, walk you through it. Um, it. It involves looking at water management. It involves looking at water as a flexible resource uh, and as a resource that is embedded in natural and societal domains that interact with each other in a political space. So water problems inherently involve politics. It involves polit interactions between natural variables, such as the water quality, water quantity, the ecosystems. It involves interactions between societal variables, such as your governance, your human resources, or the economic resources. And then all both these sets of both these sets interact, both these sets of factors interact in a space that is inherently political, inherently emotional. So, um, just wanted to highlight that uh, basically your role play. Um, last bit was the importance of involving all of the key stakeholders uh, and not just not just uh, making the decision with only a few representatives. 
Um, I, I, uh, I think we already talked about Bhatna. Uh, one thing that I wanted to uh, talk about is inventing possible trades. Uh, for instance, I got the many possible trades in contingent commitments to create mutual gains, to create shared value. Uh, for instance, Southland would only agree to an equal contribution for environmental flows if it gets the necessary funding. So, you know, that adding that, that contingency, adding that additional comment in there to create more value, to get more parties to agree, trying to estimate the Bhatna of others. Um, uh, again, the political, the interaction between society, political, etc. It all comes in, um, and as we saw with the Basin Authority, and very quickly introduce the water diplomacy framework. Um, essentially, there are three propositions that the framework, I mean, I've put up readings and I've put up, uh, uh, there's a book by uh, Islam and Saskine uh, that you can access. It's, it's a good read, especially if you are interested in boundary crossing negotiations. There's a course that is offered uh, every year at the Harvard Law School uh, that focuses on, on just this, negotiations and boundary crossing agreements and creating shared value, etc. So, I mean, I'm going to upload um, uh, more on that. But just very, very quickly, uh, the key propositions of the water diplomacy framework is that the boundaries of water networks, they're not mixed, they're not set, they're constantly changing, they're evolving. Jo in this basin, art say, in this basin, the environment in which the basin is embedded is changed, not, not, not just literally, uh, we will be, but the environment in which the basin, the players have changed, the representatives of the basin have changed, right? So, uh, boundaries are, and representation in water networks is continuously changing. The second proposition is that modeling and forecasting for water management has to account for variability. It has to account for uncertainty. And up, you can't just make predictions, you, water engineers of public policy uh, makers he hurry water to handle nahi kar sakte. You need all stakeholders, you need multiple perspectives. So I have a, I have a, 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 a nice cartoon here. So, you know, the engineer says, you know, we have an indicator that, you know, we can use to measure this and solve the problem for you. And the social scientist says, Oh no no, uh, you know I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a story. I know I know ke log kya samajhte hai. I know ke logon ka perspective kya hai. I know how the people are being affected by this this grave water problem. I know how the people are being affected by water pollution. Right? It's not just numbers or narratives. It is numbers and narratives both. You have to take into account multiple perspectives. You have to take into account all stakeholders. Um, Going back, the last bit is um, that, that the framework sort of elucidates is uh, that the politics of transboundary water management must be adapted at, and negotiated using a non-zero-sum approach, the mutual gains approach, the value-creating approach, an approach that focuses on BACNA, the best alternative to negotiated agreement, an approach that focuses on creating shared value for all key stakeholders. Um, so, what I, uh, this is what I was talking about. Uh, you have water quantity, quality, and the ecosystem within the natural domain. And you have your norms, values, your governance, your assets, whether they're natural or um, uh, uh, human, human resources, economic resources, and the societal domain. And they both, these both steps interact within a political domain. I think we just we just need to be cognizant of that and use a mutual gains approach to sort of bring that bring more value out of our uh, negotiation to in order to solve complex water management problems. I'm going to leave you uh, with that. Um, there's it's been a long day, uh, and I want to thank you all for staying around for the road based simulation. Uh, feel free to reach out to me in case you have any questions. Thank you so much. I felt like it was Sorry, can we can we just hear Sam's question?
No, no, no. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that result. Darwin. Yeah. No, no. I was happy with the situation. Yeah. I was being bribed constantly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, basically, phys physical, my question is that implicitly, if all these seven people actually know their benefits of each strategy, I feel that you can easily find some kind of Nash equilibrium even before going into the negotiations. If there's full information disclosure, you ask each person that what is the value that you attach to each strategy? Should we have you know, a strategy such as allocations, you know, you distribute the allocations to the water body, you, you know, uh, or you, you know, all those kind of strategies that we had. If everybody tells us exactly how they value them, you can put them in a game theoretic model and find a Nash equilibrium and that should be where net benefits are maximized, right? Well, okay, so this is exactly, that's what the conventional thing says. Yeah. That's what, remember the not just numbers or stories, it's both. Yeah. Right? So the difference really is that you're trying to if players if, the, if players sort of pre-decide the value that they're going to place on, you know, outcome A, outcome B, outcome three C, then there's going to be no opportunity to create shared value. No opportunity to enhance or improve upon the value that the player attaches to a particular outcome. So you're saying those implicit values will increase as the negotiation process. Exactly. Continues. So the negotiation process, I mean, a Nash equilibrium in the event of in, in, in the information asymmetry that typically exists, uh, the, 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 the process is for creating shared value. The negotiation process and the mutual gain approach it leads to shared value creation that is over and above what a Nash would allow. I have a, I have a chart here that sort of compares uh, the conventional conflict resolution theory that typically argues for hard bargaining in the by prisoner dilemma style theory, etc. and the mutual gains approach. And um, I think when I uh, when when you look at the reading also, it's 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 a framework. It's not, um, it, it's in many ways it's, it's developed, but in many ways it's not as concrete as what the Nash words. You know, it doesn't lay out a solution for you. Yeah. It only lays out an approach for you. Okay. So, I, and I think the value is in focusing on the, on the approach. I'll upload the slides, uh, but as I said, we'll not be able to upload the data. Thank you. Okay, the venue for tomorrow is the same.